Bye. Sharing food is so important, they've developed a strict etiquette all their own. So, are there some rules that I should know before I start eating? Yeah. Most of the time, you have to eat on the right hand side, mm -hmm. and whatever is left on your hand, you don't have to put back to the plate. Right. And sometimes, if you're eating small amounts, some people start to put in your mouth. <laughs> this is just helping each other. Really? And giving respect. Really? In our country, we call it force feeding. Yeah, Come on in. Uh, you. Hey, dive in there. I guess the first, yeah, the first thing I want to do is try. What are these again? Uh, that's the hook. Yeah. That's the crepe, stuffed with chicken and onion. <laughs> good? Yeah. Oh, very good. Just get. Very good. Wow, the zahook is very nice. You did a nice job on the zahook. Now it's time to try some of the wekalim. You remember the ox intestine with chopped goat innards inside? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's just, it's hard to eat. It's chunky and gristly and livery and gamey and uh -huh. old tasting, like it was hanging on that string outside uh -huh. for a very long time. How long does it hang there? If there is a good sunshine, after they clean it, it can dry with one day. If there is no rain, they have to hang it in the kitchen. Then it can dry. For more than one day? Yeah, more than one day. <laughs> and you see, this also proves what my wife's theory is, which is that I'm a really bad listener, because right now, I remember Hailey telling me very specifically what you take, you need to eat, and not put back. So now I have to take the rest of this and eat it. Oh, my God. You may remember, Hailu also told me it's a mark of respect when someone feeds you by hand. Oh, for me? For me? Yeah. From you? <laughs> no, 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 not yeah. I'm, I'm, uh... <laughs> <laughs> you are very good, thank you. Mm. This is wonderful. I haven't been taken this well care of since I was about seven months old. <laughs> I got to admit, some of the food here is a challenge to eat, but there's no mistaking the good natured generosity of the people sharing it with me. The food is exquisite, and I can't, I can't thank you enough. Thank you very much. Tell I, I, I. I got a little gift. Okay. This is a tradition Hailu told me about before lunch. Whenever possible, bring a gift for the hostess. Yes. Shukran. This is for shukran. you. She says shukran. You can say often. That is for you. Go ahead, open it. Oh, oh, can yeah, carry? check it out. <laughs> yeah, oh, wait till you see. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. I was told. I was told that a red dress is okay to give to another lady. Yeah. Here. <laughs> when you're invited to eat in Ethiopia, you never know what the meal might be. But I guarantee you'll never forget the generous hospitality of the people who share it with you. Coming up next, you drink it every morning. But trust me, when you make it from scratch, you have a much keener appreciation for your morning cup of joe. I'm not screwing this up too bad, am I? And later, eating raw camel and sharing it with some new friends. That scared the crap out of me. Ethiopia is the land where scientists say our earliest known human ancestors walked the earth. In the eastern highlands around the city of Harar, a few hundred miles from where those earliest fossils were discovered, I'm on the trail of another great contribution Ethiopia made to human history. Ethiopia is the birthplace of mankind, and it's also the birthplace of coffee. They take their coffee very seriously here in Harar, from how it's grown to how it's served. The story goes, coffee was first discovered here about a thousand years ago, when a goat herder noticed his goats got very frisky after eating red berries, got very frisky after eating red berries like these. Today, coffee is Ethiopia's number one export. But for people here, it's more than a business, it's also an art form. So with help from my guide, Abdul Ahmed, I'm heading out in search of the perfect cup of coffee from people who've been making it the same way for, oh, about 10 centuries. 
Here's where it starts. At a family coffee plantation outside Harar. This is how they get the actual beans out of the hard-shelled berries picked off the coffee plants. You see the already now? It's breaking. You can see the beans now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Getting the bean out of its shell is a process called hulling. Wow. And doing it this way takes skill as well as strength. Can I try? Yes. She doesn't trust me. She doesn't trust me. She doesn't want to... Jeez, Louise! <laughs> Holy moly, you must have some serious pipes. Okay. Oh, she, <laughs> I won't... I promise you, I won't hit your hand. You ready? Okay, okay do it. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> yeah, there goes half the year's coffee crop. Yeah, I'm a mess at this. I'm gonna... There goes the whole harvest. Best to leave this job to the professionals. After they crush for a while, the broken bits of the husk are shaken loose and blown away. And then the cycle repeats until there's nothing left but the coffee beans. If these don't look much like the coffee beans you buy, it's because they still need to go through a drying and roasting process. They do have machines for that part of the work, but I'm looking for Ethiopia's very best cup of coffee. And that's the one where everything is done by hand. So my next stop, is an Ethiopian coffee ceremony in the city of Harar. The coffee ceremony is at the center of everyday social life here. It can be casual, sometimes very formal, but it always means going to a lot of trouble to get the coffee just right. Zelalem Shifarao works in a local health clinic and is a member of one of Harar's wealthiest families. She's invited oh, Abdul and I to her home for a demonstration of the ritual at its most elaborate. Wow. Hello. Hello. It starts with the roasting. No machines, just fresh beans over open coals. After the roasting comes the grinding. You guessed it, ground by hand. And then the grounds are mixed directly with boiling water and left to steep until the hostess decides it's time to pour. Making a cup of coffee this way can take up to three hours, but no one's in a hurry. The relaxed, easy socializing is as much the point here as making the perfect cup of coffee. I find it interesting because in our country, getting a cup of coffee is all about speed and how fast you can get it. Yeah. And here, getting a cup of coffee is all about taking as much time as possible. <laughs> yeah. This is a traditional way. Yeah. At least we get snacks while we wait. Lots of snacks, but no sweets. It's a tray of corn, beans, and chickpeas. This kind of makes sense because coffee is very acidic and very strong. You got to put yeah, some stuff yeah, like this in your body. Yeah, first. the coffee is very strong. That's why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here's the most interesting discovery on the snack tray: popcorn without the corn. This is outrageous. It's made from sorghum. The seeds look like corn kernels, but when they pop, whoa, look out. They're smaller, fluffier, without those dry husks that can stick in your throat with regular popcorn. Dude, this is how you and I are gonna get rich. Look at that. In America, we love really big things or really small things. Mini popcorn. This tastes like real. Yeah. Heavily flavored popcorn, very, very corny popcorn, but it's got a super light finish. This is going to be, I'm telling, you, yeah. I'm telling you right now, this is going to be the next big thing after people see this. Okay. The taste is awesome. But enough with the popcorn. Bring on the coffee. After a long, long wait, it's finally ready. <sighs> That's some good coffee. Wow. She said, take you. That is really, really good. That's good. That's just bright, intense coffee flavor on the front part of your mouth. And then when you swallow, it's like someone just shoved a chocolate bar into your nose. That's the black coffee with the sugar. But for guests who may not like sugar, tradition calls for also serving the coffee with salt and with butter. Can we try the salty one? That'll be fun. I've never had salt in my coffee. Yeah? The smiles all around me should have tipped me off. They knew something I don't. But soon, I will. It's good. <laughs> no, it's not good. It's terrible. Who likes coffee with salt in it? No one, she said. No one. Nobody, nobody likes coffee with salt. In this room, yeah. It's like strong seawater. 
I get the feeling I'm being had, but Abdul keeps a straight face. The last one with butter you want to try? Well, let me, let's do this in advance. Who drinks coffee with butter? No, this not, it's not the tradition of here. It's a garage doing this. For some people, like the garage whose village I visited, coffee with butter is great stuff. But not here in Harar. They're just serving it to see how far I'm willing to go. It's just the combination. I mean, I've, I've put things into my mouth that no human being should ever try. <laughs> but this is just so strange. I mean, it scares me. All right, here we go. I'm not even taking any more than that. Okay. Ladies, I'm with you. No, this is worse than the salt. That fatty, fermented butter taste. It's like coffee with weak cheese in it. Yeah. Yeah. See, they're laughing at me. It's been quite a day. I reached my goal of finding what may be the best cup of coffee I've ever tasted and followed it up with one of the strangest brews I've ever had. But along the way, I got a taste of what really makes drinking coffee in Ethiopia such an event. The way it can bring people together and give them plenty of time to relax and truly enjoy each other's company. The best, really. Coming up next, I cannot believe I'm doing this. Eating raw kidney pulled fresh from a camel carcass. We've now kind of upped the ante quite a bit. And when night falls, you'll see how we up the ante even higher. I'm from Minnesota. We don't feed hyenas for fun. Hi. At the heart of modern Harar is the old city, surrounded by walls built 500 years ago. It's from a time when Harar was an island of Muslim culture in a sea of hostile tribes and warlike Christians. That's why Harar was a forbidden city, closed to all non-Muslims for about 200 years on pain of death. Today, the risk is gone, but the place still feels exotic. Well, this is a Muslim market. I've asked local tour guide Hailu Gashaw and his friend Mulageta to bring me to one of the local butcher shops where I can sample an Ethiopian delicacy, freshly killed raw meat. Yeah, and I guess that's the yeah. sign that tells everybody that the camel meat is fresh today. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's right. And you're invited. It doesn't get any fresher than this. Whether it's camel, beef, or goat, they just kill it, slice it up, and start eating. Raw meat eaten this way is called tirasiga. According to legend, Ethiopians started eating tirasiga centuries ago when warriors ate their meat raw because cooking fires might reveal their camp to an enemy. I'm especially fond of the drying meat over there that's covered in bugs. That's the good stuff. We'll start with the beef, dipping the pieces in a mix of lemon juice and berbere, the traditional Ethiopian blend of fiery hot spices. Just like that, huh? Yeah. Wow. Well, you got a couple things going on here. This meat is fantastic. Yeah. The texture and the flavor, it tastes the way beef is supposed to. <laughs> really, bl really bloody and irony. You know, in our country, they've bred all the flavor and the fat out of the meat. So to taste something like this is just spectacular. This is killer too. Lemon juice and spices, very spicy, very hot. It's very good. I also like the fact if you hold onto the meat in your finger long enough, you get a lot of flies on you. Huh? Spicy, lemony, beefy and bloody. And certainly, in a gritty environment, it kind of makes the experience. Oh, that's good. That's a kidney of camel. That's camel kidney? Yeah. We're going to eat that? Yeah. My God. This is a camel that was up and walking around just a little while ago. And now its kidneys are warm on the counter in front of me. So you just take a nice bloody piece of camel kidney. Yeah. And then you dip it in the same sauce? Yeah. Testing it. <laughs> I cannot believe I'm doing this. This, You know, in, in most parts of the world, this would be considered very strange. We've now kind of upped the ante quite a bit. The flies seem to like the camel kidneys more because I can feel them weighing me down. <laughs> Let me just tell you, 
that the milky, bloody flavor of raw camel kidney is nothing compared to the sound that it makes while you're chewing it. That's crunchy. My gosh. There's only so many bites of this that I can take. Mmm. God, I hope that's fresh camel. In a poor country like this, meat is scarce and expensive. This is a rare treat. And one thing I've learned about Ethiopia, anytime there's something good on the table, sharing is taken for granted. When you go to a butcher shop and you buy meat to eat raw, is it usually part of the custom for the guys that you're buying it from to eat half of it? Normally in Harar we have a nice hospitality. Ah. You have to share, that's a lie. He's cutting for you and you eat. I've seen a lot of examples of people in Ethiopia sharing what they have, but I've never seen anything like the way my new friend Mulageta shares food. After everyone eats, he gathers up the scraps and heads for the edge of town. You may be surprised by who shows up every evening to eat those scraps, and really surprised by how they get served. That's coming up next. Every night at dusk, outside the walls of the Ethiopian city of Harar, a call goes out across the barren wilderness surrounding the town. Hello! Hello! It's literally a call of the wild, summoning the hyenas of Harar to a nightly ritual. Tonight, I'm heading outside the city gates along with my guide, Hailu, to watch the ritual and take part in it. His name is Mulageta Woldiamariam, but he's known as the Hyena Man. And the ritual is feeding hyenas one by one, up close and very personal. Oh my gosh, you've got to be kidding me. The ritual I'm seeing began just 40 years ago, but it's said to come from a Harari tradition that's over 800 years old. They're huge. The tradition began as a kind of peace offering to protect the city from potentially dangerous animals. Hyenas can be skillful hunters with powerful jaws capable of crushing bones. I've never seen a hyena in the wild before in my whole life. The hyena man learned this skill from the man who performed this ritual before him, and he's always willing to encourage newcomers. You want to try? You want to fit? Yeah. We'll put you a piece of meat and you can fit it. All right. Come here, fella. Come here. There you go. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. There you go. There you go. You want that one? <laughs> That's for you. There you go. There you go. Now, first time hyena feeders should take note. <laughs> You don't want to get your fingers in there too early in the process. Now, you've had some. All right, there. Those are some big teeth. Do they have names? Yes. Just as I start to relax around my new friends, Mulageta ups the ante. The ritual also includes feeding the hyenas mouth to mouth. <laughs> sure, guys, go ahead and laugh. Just be gentle about taking that next bite. There you go. Hello. <laughs> Here you go. Here you go. You, my friend, have bad breath. <laughs> then, Hailu and the hyena man decide to make it more interesting. They break my stick in half. <laughs> well, after a while, the sticks just get smaller. The hyenas get a little more hungry, but the sticks get smaller. All right, buddy, you ready? That scared the crap out of me. <laughs> Figuratively, not literally. <laughs> Dude, he was like this far away! <laughs> Mulageta has names for each of his dinner guests, like Tika and Shime. But to me, the teeth all look the same. It's getting crowded out here. Wild hyenas have been known to attack people, but the hyenas of Harar have become peaceful neighbors. 
<laughs> oh my gosh! Here's what's really funny. That was the meat that I was eating this afternoon. <laughs> Settle down. Some of these guys have had a lot. He's a pretty animal. I had no I had no idea that they were so. I like these guys. I always used to be afraid of hyenas. Now I've eaten with them. When the lights go out, the hyenas will enter the town using these openings in the walls created just for them and clear the marketplace of all its garbage by eating it. So they eat pretty well. Yes. The relationship between Harar and its hyenas is one more example of Ethiopian hospitality softening a very harsh life. Thank you very much. That, that, was, that was an experience, that is for sure. That was fantastic. Maybe tomorrow night we can come back and feed some other animals. What else you got? Ethiopia is a land of scarcity and hardship, but it's also a place where people will cheerfully give you the food off their plate. The food is distinctive, the coffee is unforgettable, but what's most memorable here is the way Ethiopians make use of what little they have to celebrate their community. And it's a community any visitor is welcome to join. So remember, when you're in Ethiopia, if it looks good, eat it. There, let me get a picture of you guys. Oh, you look beautiful. It's a lot of hands and fingers. Say hi to everybody. Hi.